The CDC is warning the number and rate of coronavirus cases in children in the U.S. has been steadily increasing. The agency admitted that tracking the cases has been difficult due to lack of widespread testing and the prioritization of testing for adults. For more on this, let's bring in New York pediatrician Dr. Diane Hess. She's joining us now from New York City. So, doctor, as we just heard, UNC had to abruptly end in-person classes for undergrads. Uh, this is what most people were worried about. Is it safe to send these students home? Is it safe to reopen these universities for in-person classes? Well, I think like that mom said, this was a failed experiment. You know, I was, as I was going on the news, I was reading about the state of North Carolina and the state of North Carolina has a rate of uh, cases of about 5.4% right now. So that school really shouldn't be opened. I mean, I know we're talking in New York City about reopening schools and we want to keep the rate less than 1%. And if it's up to 3%, we're going to shut the schools down. So why is North Carolina opening at all when predominantly state school um, and the rate of COVID is too high in their state? So they should not have been open because there's definitely going to be employees, uh, resident assistants, and students who are coming to college campuses with COVID. They were not required to be tested. So it is not shocking. You put kids in a crowded living situation, regard oh yes, the parties are gonna you know, trigger it even more. But if you're in crowded housing, which is a dorm with a shared bathroom and a shared common kitchen, they cannot, they, they, without their parents' supervision, many of these kids are not gonna keep their mask on all the time and even with their parents' supervision because they feel like they're at home. So it is not surprising to me at all. You know, I was talking to my, uh, some officials from my alma mater uh, a few days ago, and we were talking about in-person versus virtual learning, doctor. And I just sort of mentioned that, you know, when I was in college, I, you know, more things happened to me medically in college than at any other point in my life. I mean, I, I broke a bone, you know, you, you, all sorts of weird things go through the dorms, you know, kids get sick and the flu and on top, because we're, we're just sort of young and in the mindset that nothing can go wrong and that we're healthy. <laughs> And so when, when I hear stories like this, and then I see some of the images that are coming back of kids partying, of kids getting together, I, I don't blame young people for wanting to hug their best friends or wanting to get together and have a good time with their best friend. That's why people who are in charge of these schools should be making these better decisions. Exactly. Like some of the schools that were supposed to go back into session but already didn't even do that, had plans to bring back, you know, the students in a hybrid method. So like maybe only part of the freshman class was going to be brought back or uh, some of the sophomores and they were going to do it staggered. But even at that point, many of the schools decided, you know what, this is, we tried, we, we have this plan in place, but we feel like it's not going to work out. So we're just not bringing our students back. And it is, it is heartbreaking because I, like, I had patients who were already in the midst of their quarantine. So some of my college students were quarantining for 14 days before they were going to schools. And then they had to, they were going to be required to sign a waiver that they couldn't leave the state once they got to their school until Thanksgiving. So there are so many stressors. And, and I was thinking about it, like, you've never been away from home and you were going away and then you're signing this paper. Like, I won't see my parents until Thanksgiving. And for some some young people, that's really hard. Like they've never been away before, or um, or they have other illnesses or other th family situations where they really did want to go home. So we were putting so many pressures on these kids to get back into school, into college, um, but without doing it the right way. What they did in Chapel Hill, they brought everybody back at the same time. Huge, you know, it was huge state school. Um, I think a lot of it is driven by sports. To be honest, I think that a lot of the schools that are bringing back. All the students at once are big football schools that are going to lose a ton of money without a football season. And uh, I think that was prioritized before the students' health. Yeah, except that the virus doesn't care about sports. The virus doesn't care <laughs> what party affiliation you have. Uh, and we're seeing that across the country. We've been showing some images of younger children, too. You mentioned something that was interesting in New York City, um, that uh, schools are reopening because New York City has been able to keep uh, that infection rate very low, around 1% or lower. But uh, my brother's a teacher here in New York City, and he said specifically in the neighborhood or in the community where his school is, the infection rates are at 5%, which is not a good sign. So um, how should, for schools that decide to reopen, um, how should kids be, for example, moving from classroom to classroom? How should they be eating their lunch? Um, how does that all work? So for most schools that are gonna reopen, we're not gonna have kids moving from classroom to classroom. They're gonna keep the children in the classroom at desks six feet apart, from what I understand. They're gonna have windows open and most of the schools that are reopening in New York City, they have been tested that they do have proper ventilation and that the teacher will move in and out. The kids will even 
eat lunch at their desk. And when they do go outside, it'll be in recess in these small groups. So they're trying to limit uh, the movement of students in the hallway. They're trying to limit movements of kids in an indoor area. Like they won't have indoor gym if they have a parking lot or a place that they can cordon off for kids to play outside. A, a playground, they will be outside. But that small group will stay together. You know, when we're talking about pods. So we're trying to do pods. And that way, if there is a positive case, they can just um, isolate those kids who are in that pod or those teachers that were in that pod rather than the whole entire school. So there won't be a large amount of kids in a cafeteria. And I do hear your brother's um, concerns about working in a in an area where the rate is positive. Now, this is very, very high, like around 5%. So what's interesting in New York City is that kids come from all over to go to schools. You don't only go to your own school. So I think what um, Mayor de Blasio is thinking, yes, the rate might be high in this certain area in the Bronx, but most of the kids who are coming to school are coming from all over New York City. And we take those kids in a pool together and the rate amongst those populations, it's less than 5%. I am not sure about that, especially in the elementary schools where kids go to mo school more locally. But that, that definitely is a concern. That's a great point to make there. Uh, Doctor, it's always great to talk to you for some sound, scientifically <laughs> I have two teenagers that I need analysis. in school, so I follow this very closely. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it, Dr. Okay. Hess. Thank you so much. Take care.